I'm on the road in central Victoria. What I'm looking at today promises to be exceptional. Arriving at Stonefields is a great journey. I think probably drama is the, is, is the word. So the first thing you do is you come down the road and you're surrounded by these wonderful gum trees. And they're two or three hundred year old gum trees. You come through the gatehouse and all of a sudden you come into the main garden. And it's very casual and very relaxed when you first come in. Visitors get out of the car and the first part of the garden they come into is a very restrained small courtyard. And it's deliberately set up like that so it creates anticipation. And you walk around the hedges for a very tight space and all of a sudden you get this great big drama of this great big sort of garden in front of you. Paul Bangay is one of our best known landscape designers and he's won an Order of Australia medal for his services to landscape architecture. But I'm here to see the garden he created for husband Barry and himself. The house came first and positioning the house came first, so setting the house. So what I did is I drove down to my car, parked the car where I thought was the right spot, no, moved it onto the next spot and waited till the view got absolutely perfect and then worked out from the garden back from there. So we got all the main access coming through well. You know, you come through and you can look right through the centre of the house to the, to the landscape on the other side and the pool on the other side. I went to Iran one year and saw the wonderful use of canals they do there and this channel of water or the rill you know, takes you and it, it really forms the main axis through the garden. Wind is a big issue here, isn't it? Wind is an extraordinary issue here. And the first night I stayed there, the wind was whistling around the house and it's like, because <laughs> yes. we're on top of a hill, you know, it's coming from the south and then it came from the north in the summer. But so the response to that was to plant these hedges around. And so I wanted the feeling of a wall garden. I couldn't afford to build it all in brick wall, so we did it in the hedging. And now the hedging is established, you can't hear the wind at all in the house. It's amazing. Can you tell us a little bit more about this part of the garden? Yeah, so these are our blue borders. So they're full of blue perennials in the summer. And what we try and do is do as much succession planting as we can. So we get the tulips coming up now, and then all the blue perennials will come up after that and flower right through summer and autumn. Then you come to the apple walk, and these are crimson crisp apples. So we try and get as much productivity in the garden as we can. And then we've got the clouds of English box spheres underneath. And then our parterre, which is full of 8,000 white tulips. 8,000? Yeah, and we keep adding to those every year. These shapes, what, what inspired those? Well, I, I just wanted a contemporary version of a parterre. You know, I, di I didn't want that typical Renaissance European, so it's just a play on squares and circles. It's really simple, but it, 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 it attracts you. you. It does. You can't help but sort of look at them all and they, they feel like really human-like. But they're a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> As you move from garden room to garden room, you can see Paul's influences are very European. Gravel paths, obviously. Um, the house was loosely based on an Italian hillside villa, so it's a collection of older buildings, the bell tower, and our little pavilions here yeah. with the stack slate, as opposed to the slate on the, on the um, diagonal. And of course, here in our white garden, full of white water lilies when they're in flower and, and the water irises, just looks spectacular. So I didn't want a pretty English style rose garden. So I did all the colours you see in a Persian rug. So they're all deep claret, reds and maroons. And you can see we've still got the citrus there. So yeah. there's a little bit more of a Persian influence. And then this is Anthriscus, raven's wing, with this lovely bronze foliage. With all the colours in here, just like a Persian rug. Does it fly? Almost. <laughs> looks like, it looks like he's flying the carpet. He's flying the rug right here. I got this when I was 16 years of age from a salvage yard in Melbourne, and all I wanted was a Roman antiquity, so I dreamt that it was a Roman antiquity. And then I placed him in the rose garden. Of course, he looked a bit odd sitting in the middle of the rose garden, so we created this shroud of wisteria around him. So I just made that metal frame and grew the wisteria it's around. It's like a, a wisteria cloak. Yeah, it's like a cloak for him. Isn't that fabulous? I love it. So this is the woodland, which you can see is very informal. And of course, our wonderful Halloborus give us all this colour at this time of the year. And they've been flowering for probably 
two months already. Really? Yeah. And then here. Yeah. Wow. So again, it's about drama. So you sort of come up a very winding, narrow path, and it opens up into this lovely big expanse. And I mean, when as I, a woodland. I imagine when when the canopy is in full cover. Yeah. Like the shade and the temperature would yeah. be would be really cool. That's exactly right. So we planted it to be a microclimate. So we've got the band of evergreens around the outside and their laurels and bays, and then these sugar maples and pin oaks to give us shade. This view speaks for itself, but having it raises some interesting points about choices in garden design. The really important thing is when you look from the house, you see the valley beyond, but you don't see the foreground so much. So it looks like the garden's sort of floating in the landscape. And that's that classic English ha ha, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Love ha ha's. I mean, so it separates the outer landscape, the uncultivated from the cultivated on this side. So the cattle can come up and it also doubles as a pool fence, which is handy for us. And what have you intended with your planting along this, this edge, this ha-ha edge? Well, so we don't disturb the view from the house, we kept the planting really low. So we've got lots of salvia and amaurosas, daylilies, and very low-growing penstemons. So it's all intense blue and red here. Stonefields is a garden of bold statements that change with the seasons. Paul's garden is amazing, and he's an incredibly successful garden designer. What's the key? Uh, I truly believe you've got to learn how to grow the plants. It's not good enough just to be able to name plants. You actually know how to grow them, cultivate them, and the whole act of gardening, I think, is critical to a good garden designer. And where did Paul learn his gardening craft? In the veggie patch. My parents were great gardeners, in particular my mother, and I was the veggie gardener in the family. So I was given a little plot of land and I turned into the vegetable garden, grew all the vegetables for the family. 